Hi, I'm Mark Gaylor. I'm a Sony Imaging Ambassador and I'd like to take the opportunity to review Sony's FE 20mm f1.8G. This is an ultra wide angle prime and it's one of my favourite lenses, the reasons of which will become clear as we go through the review. So without much further ado, let's get started. Okay, so we have three wide angle primes from Sony. These are the 14mm f1.8 G Master. We have the 20mm f1.8 G lens in the middle there. And then we have the 24mm f1.4, and that's another G Master lens. Now you might be considering one of these primes instead of say the FE1635 f2.8 G Master Zoom. Now obviously there is a cost saving to be had by investing in one of the primes rather than the zoom lens. We also have a weight saving, we have a, a wider maximum aperture, and of course uh, they're cheaper, especially the one in the middle here, that's the 20mm f1.8. Being a G rather than a G Master, it comes in at uh, 898 US dollars on B&H at the time of making this review. And it's the smallest and lightest and cheapest of these three wide angle primes. So uh, it's actually the, has the widest angle of view that will accept screw on filters or magnetic filters that I actually use from Freewell here. Now if you were going for the wider angle of view from, from that 14mm G Master, you can't use screw on filters. It's got a fixed lens hood and this means that you have to put a filter cage over the front of that lens hood and then use the square 100mm size filters. Now obviously there is going to be a cost saving again by having the uh, screw on or magnetic filters. There's also a speed issue here. It's obviously much uh, faster to quickly attach one of these uh, magnetic filters. Now I have an ND8 and an ND64 and I can actually combine them on the 20mm f1.8G without clipping the corners. Now you can only really use one filter on the 1635 G Master Zoom but you can stack these ND filters. So I can basically get a nine stop ND by adding the ND8 on top of the ND64. And that 67mm filter thread means that I can use these magnetic filters on my FE 35mm G Master and also the 85mm F1.8 which share that 67mm filter thread. Okay, so it's a G series lens, but by if you look carefully, you might mistake this for a G Master lens. We have the AFMF uh, switch on the lens. We have a custom button. Now, by default, that's uh, programmed to the focus hold, but we can reprogram that as any other custom button in the camera menus. We also have that aperture ring, and we also have the ability to de-click that aperture ring, which is um, a great feature for videographers wanting to slide the aperture rather than go in one third of a stop clicks. Now it's small and light for a 1.8 prime. It's also got the uh, two of the new XD linear focus motors so it's really rapid focusing lens and we have nine curved aperture blades to improve the out of focus bokeh areas. We also have a close focusing distance of 0.18 meters or just seven inches. So we can really get up close and personal with the subjects that we're taking to try and push that shallow depth of field if that's what we're trying to do. Now there are a few other G series lenses in Sony's lineup that also feature all of those but they don't have the wide aperture, that f1.8 aperture. These small compact uh, G lenses uh, have maximum aperture of either 2.8 or 2.5 so we lose one stop by getting that compact features of these smaller G lenses. Now, if you're looking for competitor, uh, competing lenses, I would pos possibly take a look at the Sigma 20mm f2 DG DN. Now, obviously, we've got a slightly wider aperture on the Sony there, but they come in at about the same um, uh, weight. Uh, the Sigma is a little bit smaller, but um, the, the, the weight is about the same. You might also be looking at the Batis 2.8 18mm. Now that has a wider angle of view, but it has a maximum aperture of 2.8. I do have a little bit of a soft spot for that Batis because I really like the uh, depth of field scale. 
on the barrel of the lens, which is great when we're trying to dial in the hyperfocal distance, which is common when we're trying to do um, landscapes with deep focus. But of course it doesn't have a, a button on the lens and it doesn't have an aperture ring and it doesn't have an AF, MF. So there's sort of swings and roundabouts there. The Zeiss Batis unfortunately also comes in at uh, double the price of the FE 20mm f1.8 G. Now rather than tell you how uh, much I think this uh, lens is uh, sharp and well built, I'm going to leave that for Lens Rentals as an independent company testing uh, these prime lenses. Now they won't just test one lens to get these MTF charts, they will uh, test uh, 10 lenses and then take the average. Now if you're used to reading MTF charts you'll already see that this is spectacularly sharp in the central portion and yes it does fall off towards the edges but you only need to stop down a couple of apertures uh, to get sharp crisp focus in the corners and I'll demonstrate that uh, uh, shortly. Now um, Roger who uh, reviewed this lens obviously had a bit of a soft spot for this lens and I'm going to just quote Roger on this one. Uh, the FE 20mm f1.8 is a home run. It's really amazing. The resolution is awesome, the lack of astigmatism and lateral colour is more awesome and the flat field most awesome. If you want a wide aperture prime for your FE system get this one. If you don't want a wide aperture prime for your FE system heck get it anyway. You can see that it's really been taken aback with this uh, the quality uh, and um, sharpness of this lens. Uh, and in summing up he says this is actually rather spectacular. The center resolution is phenomenal. Resolution drops off slowly and steadily towards the edges. Most amazingly there is almost no separation between the sagittal and tangential MTF which means there is almost no astigmatism or lateral color. Now that is great when working wide open. This is really strong features for this lens and I'm going to show you some examples which is how I prefer to show you how sharper lenses just by giving you access to uh, 6K images and check in the info section for the link to the gallery of the supporting images that will support this lens review. Now even wide open at f1.8 if you need to use the, the wider apertures because you're working in dark alleyways we can still get a more than acceptable corner sharpness. So if I go up into the corner of that image you can still see it's really uh, sharp enough even when shooting wide open. One of the great things about having an ultra wide angle lens that even at the maximum aperture we've got plenty of depth of field if we're not super super close to the foreground information. As you can see from this uh, corner shot that I've captured of this building here in an alleyway you can see as we move to the extreme left and right sides of the image uh, even though there's a little bit of soft focus there it is uh, really quite astounding how much depth of field you get even at the maximum apertures. So um, this is obviously quite useful when you know, for street photographers working maybe at night or in dark alleyways. We can uh, quite comfortably use that maximum aperture. Here this uh, image was captured at ISO 3200. So with uh, maybe a, a lens that doesn't have these ultra wide apertures then we are obviously going to be struggling at keeping the ISO acceptably low. Let's stop down a couple of stops. Now I've got this image inside of Lightroom and I'm going to zoom into 100% magnification and take you right into the corners at f4. And as we look at that you're going to see that uh, we do have really crisp sharp focus. We don't need to stop down to f8 or f11 uh, if we're not looking for the depth of field but if we just want to get superb corner sharpness we are going, only going to have to stop down one or two stops to get that uh, excellent performance performance uh, from this 1.8 uh, lens. And as we move into that bottom right hand corner again spectacularly sharp. And you will have an opportunity to zoom in. I'll put the uh, 6K that's uh, 6,000 pixels wide images so you can zoom in a couple of times and check the sharpness for yourselves. So any times where we've got good ambient lighting and you stop down to f11 um, focus becomes like a non-issue because everything is going to be sharp in front of the lens. Now uh, Lens Rentals did compare this with a couple of high performing 1.4 aperture lens. We've got a Sigma 20mm f1.4 there that's a 20mm 1.4 and Sony's FE 24mm G Master. 
Now they've flipped the charts on the left so you can see side by side performance there. And of course, um, the higher you go on the MTF chart, the sharper the lens. And so you can see that the 20 mil at f1.8 is clearly outperforming the 1.4 aperture lenses. Yes, you have that wider aperture, but you're not getting as sharp information wide open on those 1.4 lenses. Now, one of the great things about um, um, uh, these lenses is you will possibly want to step forward in order to fill the um, foreground subject. And as we do that, even with a 1.8 aperture, we are going to get that shallow depth of field, which will probably match the 24mm 1.4 because we'll just be standing a little bit further back. And of course, it's not just the aperture, it's also your distance to the subject that controls um, the out of focus areas. Now, uh, you'll probably see on the image on the left, which is captured with the 20 mil G, the background information is pushed further away from your subject because of that steeper perspective. And it appears slightly closer on the 24 mil. And as we zoom in, you'll see that the uh, 20 mil is actually a little bit sharper than the 24. Even though we're comparing a G lens with a G master, the 20 mil G really holds up. Now we do get significantly wider angle of view, another 10 degrees angle of view on that 20 mil focal length. So it's not as close as some people might think, even though they're only four millimeters apart on the focal length. So if you're looking for um, a landscape lens where you're gonna get a wider angle of view, that 20 mil is probably gonna entice you more than the 24, especially if you already own a 24 105 or a 24 70 zoom, you are gonna be looking for that uh, extra wide aperture and also the extra angle of view. So as we um, get in close, and now I'm going to zoom in to 200%. I don't normally pixel peep, but I just want to show you how well the G is performing by zooming in. And uh, the lens rentals were basically very impressed with the lack of, of any sort of aberrations to do with this lens. Now we can see the 24mm 1.4 G Master. We've got a little bit of color fringing right up there against the bright areas, that purple color fringing. And that, of course, is completely absent from the 20 mm f 1.8 G. So you can see this is really holding up as a G, even though it's not a G master, it is uh, behaving very much like a G master in many respects. Now this for me, of course, is one of Sony's um, uh, best value for money f 1.8 full frame primes. I would put this in with the 35 mm f 1.8, the 55 1.8, Zeiss and also the 85 f1.8. These are really three very cost effective lenses. They're light, um, they're, um, they're really quite affordable for Sony Primes because the, none of these are the G Master lenses. And so these are certainly four lenses that I would always recommend for people who don't have the super budget for the G Master zooms, but do want excellent performance from a prime lens. And they also want those wide apertures as well. Now, of course, you don't have to own all of those, and I'll often only go out with two of these prime lenses. And if I had to pick uh, two from four, I would possibly pick the 20mm f 1.8G and the 85mm f 1.8. Now, I can work various locations just with these two primes without having the intermediate focal lengths. Even easier if you're working with two camera bodies. So, so to give you an example of this, I'm up in a rainforest in far north Queensland here. Now, I'm doing the establishing shots, the broader uh, shots of the forest using the 20 mil in vertical orientation. So I'm capturing almost down to my feet here. So we're getting a real sense of place. And because I'm stopping down to F8 or F11, everything inside of that frame is sharp. Now the three images in the center column are captured with the 85. This is where I single out little aspects within the broader scene. And I am using that shallow depth of field with the 85 mil at maximum aperture. And because I'm using high resolution sensors, I'll often crop in to get that sort of macro shot. I know uh, Australian spiders are large, but I can do a two times crop on some of the um, high resolution sensors that I'm working with to get even closer closer to that spider so it fills uh, the frame there. 
Okay, and just to give you some close-up examples, but I would uh, recommend that you go over to the link and look at the uh, 6K versions of these files so you can really uh, inspect the sharp detail from this lens. So those are a couple of the uh, detailed shots from that forest. Now, for most people shooting landscapes, you'll be in horizontal orientation. You'll be stopping down to F8 or F11. You might be using your neutral density filters to smooth uh, busy water. And of course, uh, for most uh, scenes, most landscapes, the 20 mil um, does have um, the angle of view that most landscape photographers will need. Yes, it's not the 16 mil from the 1635 zoom, but in most instances, as it's wide enough and so I'm giving you a couple of examples where I have indeed uh, stopped down to f11 to capture these broader landscape uh, shots here and I'll be using that in in urban environments as well as the natural landscape here now when I am stopping down to these uh, smaller apertures uh, I'm often not focusing on anything particular in the foreground because I know I can fo photograph what's called uh, the hyperfocal distance. I can basically just um, focus um, uh, in manual focus at a distance of say around about three meters and everything from say five feet to infinity is going to be pretty much sharp. If I've got something very, very close to the lens, I might stop down to f16, but often I can get um, my entire depth of field in a single capture without doing any focus stacking when using a 20 mil focal length. And I'm here, I'm using the uh, depth of field calculator with the advanced option switched on because I've increased the max print dimension to 27 inches. Because of course, acceptable sharpness is also about how close you're standing to the enlargement and how big that enlargement is. So I've increased that enlargement for people using 27 inch monitors here. Okay, so in the urban environments, if I don't have um, a, uh, anything at infinity towards the horizon line, I don't need to uh, stop down to F11, often F8, will give me all of the depth of field I need in these urban scenes. So when I'm uh, shooting in uh, um, uh, derelict buildings, etc., F8 is all I need to get everything pin sharp in the photograph. And again, I'll just be photographing at a distance of two or three meters using that hyperfocal distance. Okay, so and as you can see from these, all spectacularly sharp. I'll often use this lens for street photography as well. Now, I know 35mm and longer focal lengths are often more uh, useful in street settings, but when we're working in these type of environments, you sort of have to let people walk right close to you. Again, uh, focusing at maybe just uh, two meters away from the camera, and you can see that we're pulling uh, everything sharp. I don't have to worry about focus because that f8 aperture is going to give me all of the focus from edge to edge, even though I'm standing on a corner of this uh, street location here. Now I have, um, using a faster shutter speed here, one two thousandth of a second to freeze this size cyclist, but again, I don't need uh, to stop down more than F8 because I don't have anything way over there on the horizon line. So again, everything sharp within this uh, frame here. Now, there are going to be occasions where you may think oh, I, I do need that a little bit of a wider angle of view. Am I limited by the 20 mil focal length? And I would say maybe not because uh, in some instances you can simply take three vertical images with a 50% overlap and that is going to give you an angle of view that is possibly wider than that 14 mil uh, G Master lens. Now the way I would uh, often do this is I would um, put the camera in an L bracket and then put the L bracket on a nodal rail. It's important when you've got um, foreground information that's very, very close to the lens that you rotate the camera around the no parallax point. This ensures that the um, software that is stitching these three images is gonna have no trouble aligning both the foreground subject matter and the distance subject matter. They're not uh, going to add too much weight to your camera bag either. That uh, L bracket and nodal rail just comes in at 9 ounces or 260 grams, so it doesn't add a lot extra. That's lighter than an additional lens, but it does give you that uh, wide angle of view in many instances when we're, when we're faced with that uh, landscape scenario. 
So I would just sum up this review by just saying this, yes, this is a G series lens, but it's giving you G master performance. And I think it is one of Sony's best value for money primes out there. So hopefully you have found something of use in this and head over to those uh, high resolution examples and you can check out the sharpness yourself. I'm Mark Gaylor, Sony Imaging Ambassador.